Uh, speaking of time, the last time I was uh, down here was actually running the two oceans. <laughs> Unfortunately, I won't be able to come back uh, for this year, so I hope it's not cancelled. Uh, but I'm slated for another marathon someplace else that might also be cancelled. Uh, so running, I think, uh, as you now know, uh, is my passion. Uh, I've been running pretty much all my life, uh, and it's been very much part of what's, keeping, what's kept me going. Uh, in, uh, in working in fragile contexts. Uh, that is not my background. Uh, I'm actually a cognitive psychologist who spent most of her life researching how people learn, uh, and that is the connection. Uh, I'm kind of looking at the, what I consider to be the last frontier of learning. How do people learn under those circumstances? And now you also know that it's not the technology that's been driving me, it's been the pedagogy that's been driving me and an understanding uh, of what goes on in the brain. I've worked for many years with uh, cognitive neuroscientists. We've looked at umpteen brain scans to see how the brain's plasticity helps us understand uh, learning and progression in learning and how we need to pay attention to that. So that's a little bit about my background, also explaining to you how I come to this. And there's another dimension that brings me to that, and I'm looking at Kim, who is an old friend of mine. I was so happy to see her walk in the room, uh, and I knew that she'd moved to Stellenbosch. Um, but I'm actually also a conference interpreter. It's part of uh, another part of my career. I've worked at the United Nations for many years. I still work at the UN as a simultaneous interpreter. Uh, and that's where my research actually uh, originated. I was fascinated by what I was able to do, but didn't understand how I was able to do it. Uh, what my brain uh, you know, was doing as I was moving from one language to another with incredibly fast speakers. And now I'm going to slow down. Mm -hmm. I know there's nobody interpreting here, so I don't need to pay attention to that. Um, but I'm, uh, I've come here, and thank you to the organizers for last minute arrangements. I've only discovered you actually very late in the process. Uh, we've been funded uh, since last year by a donor, a global donor, uh, by their African um, section uh, that is located in Kenya. Um, funded for a project uh, designed to um, bring higher education opportunities to people living in fragile contexts and that, with a focus on refugees and IDPs. Uh, so that is basically what I'm going to talk about today, um, but in order for you to understand how we got there, maybe a little bit of background uh, as to what we've done over the last 10 years, starting actually with training interpreters in conflict zones. That was the origin, uh, and we did it all virtually. We did the research, uh, and after a few years we discovered, no, there is a limit to what you can do entirely virtually. Uh, there is a part of complexity in human skill acquisition uh, that requires a face-to-face -face interaction of some kind. Uh, and wrapped up in all of this, there is a very, very important social-emotional dimension to learning. And I think the world is only now coming to really appreciate SEL, uh, the abbreviation that we use now, I don't really like to talk about psychosocial support because again, it puts the emphasis too much on the support rather than the dynamic finding ways in which we can actually uh, cope uh, with adversity in order to uh, support our learning. So let, let's move, Ooh, oops. Education in emergencies and higher education in emergencies is a very, very recent addition to the landscape. Uh, but education is part of the humanitarian response, uh, has become part of the humanitarian response. However, it only commands 2% of the humanitarian budget. And that gives you an idea as to, yes, it is appreciated, but only t there is tokenism. Yes, yes, we do understand the importance of education, but hey, we're only going to give it 2% of the humanitarian budget. Uh, so that is uh, rather unfortunate, uh, but you should know it is an integral part of the humanitarian response. Now, higher education emergencies, which is what I'm talking about today, has never explicitly been part of a humanitarian response. It sits between humanitarian and development responses. 
And you may think, oh, come on, you know, that difference isn't all that important. Unfortunately, it is. Because the budget pots on which uh, we draw are not the same. Development budgets are separated from humanitarian budgets. And that nexus between the two is very poorly explored. And the world is only now coming around to realizing that a humanitarian response ultimately needs to a development response, or the two should be integrated right from the start. So we'll move forward to that. Uh, in the development of our project here in Africa, the remit of the donor was to develop an African response model. Uh, and that immediately endeared me to the donor. It was their first offer to us, and I had never worked with that donor before, so didn't quite understand you know, what was behind it. Um, but what really endeared me to the donor was, and yes, we've asked you uh, to come and think about it and leverage your networks and your knowledge and your experience, but once you're done developing the model, you're out. And that really, really um, kind of made the difference between accepting the challenge or saying, no, I'm sorry, I'm not interested. Uh, we were very interested because it fit very, very much into our philosophy uh, that the only humanitarian and development response is one that renders us superfluous, uh, that gives people the power and the ability uh, to solve their own problems. Uh, so on we went, uh, we, after trial and error, we kind of focused on the Horn of Africa. Africa is a big continent and forced displacement is obviously, you know, not just um, in the Horn of Africa, but we figured if we start, we need to start somewhere. I mean, we need to start perhaps small and we will focus on those countries that either produce the largest number of refugees and the country that receives the largest number of refugees. So we focused in our first phase now of developing the model on South Sudan, Somalia, and Kenya. Uh, that is where you see the map here, uh, giving you an idea of how many refugees are in Kenya from those two refugee uh, producing countries. There is, however, a worldwide network with over 17,000 members that is currently very active actually in the coronavirus response because it is an emergency. It's not a conflict situation as such, but uh, all the resources developed for emergency contexts with uh, 251 million children globally out of school because of the virus. Uh, we have leveraged our resources. We have made them available. It's called the International Network for Education and Emergencies. Uh, and you can go on their site. Uh, they have a, spe a special coronavirus uh, sub-site right now. Uh, and we are especially focusing also on social emotional learning and children learning alone uh, in, in these contexts. So this is really the only worldwide network uh, that has uh, worked extensively in emergencies and works with all the big international um, non-governmental organizations that respond uh, to crises like Save the Children or uh, or World Vision or NRC, etc. I mean, these, these are the really, really big names in, in responding. So in responding to a crisis context or to protracted uh, displacement crisis as we uh, see them in Kenya, I mean, the two largest refugee camps, Kakuma and Dadaab, have been around for two decades. Uh, they are not temporary anymore. There are places where people have grown up third generation sometimes. The Middle East is approaching pretty much the same situation. In Azra camp where we work, um, it's been around about six, seven years, but the Syrian crisis is not coming to an end, and these people are going to be staying in camps because that is the policy of the refugee hosting country. We have quite a bit of, uh, of, of different dimensions to it, uh, from pedagogy and learning to social emotional learning to local knowledge production, the social inclusion and uh, development theories that we integrate, the humanitarianism and the ethics, the principles that we need, uh, to, uh, need to observe, the empowerment of refugees, uh, different ways of thinking, challenging ways of thinking, and then ultimately also social change. So these all make up what we call a theory of change. Uh, the kind of change that we would like to see uh, down the road. And I'll abbreviate this a little bit, uh, that we ultimately would like to see inclusive and equitable quality higher education for sustainable <coughs> development. That's 
Uh, I don't know whether you followed a little bit globally. The, um, there were two compacts signed in 2018, the Global Compact uh, for Refugees and the Global Compact for Migration. I will not go into the politics of why there have to be two, uh, but the Global Compact for Refugees has basically recommended two countries, members of the UN system, that refugees be integrated refugees be mainstreamed because resettlement meaning a refugee gets resettled in a third country uh, has diminished significantly don't need to go into the policies of certain countries that have cut immigration almost to zero uh, but there have been different crises so in a way the focus is now on integration and mainstreaming and when you look at the protracted nature of displacement that is ultimately the only viable solution uh, whether we you know, like it or not, uh, but there are plenty of opportunities in it as well. And what that means is that in those five places, minutes. five minutes, in those places of displacement, you need to create spaces where education can happen. And that really gets me to the empowerment part, uh, where refugees, where you're building capacity in refugee camps for them to host higher education. Uh, for other refugees and this is essentially what we've built uh, in the large refugee camps. We've built higher education spaces entirely managed by refugees themselves. Uh, they've developed learning hub models. Uh, I can show you a 15 page outline of all the technology that is needed to run a learning hub like this. They've just actually delivered part of this grant uh, two weeks ago, they are consultants to us as, uh, as grant managers, uh, and their capacity is indeed uh, what, uh, what we're leveraging. Looking at these spaces, we also need to move away from uh, uh, thinking that learning is happening only in one place. When you're in a shelter and there's no electricity at night, learning isn't going to happen. Uh, well, learning has to happen somehow. Yeah? You're not going to go back to the hub. When violence breaks out in the camp, you're not going to be moving to the hub. In Kukuma, when the floods arrive, you're not going to be moving anymore because the rivers become unpassable. So learning needs to happen across the camp. And you need, your pedagogy needs to embrace both formal learning as well as non-formal and incidental learning. So this is where learning theories and our pedagogical ideas you know, need to come in and, and need to, to help develop a good system. So it's really all about the connections, but not only about technical connections, it's about human connections. And it's all about the framework, how the 21st century skills and the social emotional learning competency frameworks should inform our understanding of building a new way uh, of learning uh, in displacement. In most cases, it's actually low tech. There is very little high tech, uh, and the lower the tech, the the more assurance we have that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. So we have really, really had to uh, strain our brains to come up with low-tech solutions that are sustainable and viable, uh, rather than high-tech solutions that fail 90% of the time in those contexts, because the generator doesn't work, the solar panels are dirty, the batteries are broken, uh, and I can go on and on and on what, what's, what's happening. So we've looked really at what is a good learning model uh, and we've come up with, uh, and I can, the video, I think once it's shared, you can play the video on this. Uh, it's really having the students in the center, having a kind of, well, we, we, it is digital learning, but we still call it hybrid learning. Because the way we create the hybrid nature of it and the blended nature of it is actually in the people involved. So we have a lecturer who can, you know, sit in anywhere in the world, develops the course, uh, we've got the online tutors uh, in our model quite often. Those are students, master students at the University of Geneva or in some other university who are subject matter experts and who help the students on site to actually understand uh, the concepts and are usually on WhatsApp or Signal or some other uh, low-tech uh, site that all refugees can use. We have the on-site facilitators who are refugees themselves, graduates of previous editions of the course who actually onboard the students on site and are there every day to help people get on, on with their learning and motivating them and supporting them. And we have a course coordinator who looks 
also to some extent at you know at any sort of risk that might uh, emerge in, in those contexts. But ultimately, the students are at the center and they're all working together. So here are just some images to run you through. Uh, this is our low-tech container. It is being moved next week. We've just built a very big learning center in Kakuma. But different ways of technology, PyTop has supported us. HP is working with us uh, on you know, seeing how their technologies fare in those very difficult environments. But time and again, we're looking at how pedagogy, space, and technology integrate. Yeah? We never look at only one of these uh, at a time. We launched a cafe because that's how students get together. It's an Ethiopian cafe. You can rest assured the coffee is good. Uh, and so is the coffee ceremony. And that is very important for the Ethiopian refugees. Yeah? They come together around, uh, around that. It needs to be interest-powered, and we actually follow uh, the Connected Learning Alliance's six constructs. Yeah, and you'll see those on the next images, interest-powered. What is of interest? This is Azraq refugee camp in Jordan. S two mosques, only one has electricity. There's an engineering course that we ran, development engineering course, together with Purdue University. The problem to solve was how do we share the electricity between the two mosques? So these students got to work and ultimately they found a solution. Well, the truck that you see here is a trash truck and the refugees noticed was the trash trucks weren't picking up the trash. And they left the camp through the gates and were half empty. Developed a sensor that also had an external alarm uh, and if the truck left the camp and wasn't full, it wasn't going to be let out and had to go back and pick up the rest of the trash. And I think that goes very much back to what uh, Martin Butler said about it has to be contextualized. Yeah? Education's got to take care of the context. It has to solve real world problems and add value. Yeah? And in this case, your trash gets picked up. I believe we all agree it adds value to our lives if we don't need to live with the trash. I'll skip a little over that. Uh, there are different ways with low tech how we can encourage deeper learning. Uh, I mean, these chat um, apps are an absolute bonus for emergencies. Uh, no matter, you know, yes, it does matter who hosts them, and we are looking at alternatives uh, because of protection issues, but ultimately, you know, it is, it is that particular dimension. But there is a lot of what we call indigenous knowledge or local knowledge production. Uh, what kind, of an, what kind of gadget works in a refugee camp? That's not for the University of Geneva to solve. That's for the refugees to solve. Yeah? So they come up, they do the research, they do the analysis, and then they produce. And then, in this case, we went to the Africa e-learning conference and presented it as a solution that was locally, uh, locally produced. Or do we have uh, malaria larvae <laughs> mapping in Kakuma refugee camp? No, we don't. because. The humanitarian budget only does take care of the clinical part of health. It never takes care of prevention, or rarely. So by ha having students study you know, health issues, they can then ultimately also map the camp for malaria larvae breeding grounds, and then can tell the parents where their kids you know, should not go to school, or snake bite mapping, or scorpion uh, mapping in the camp. These are all local knowledge productions that add value to the lives of these communities and actually create community. And that's where you know, a university really has its place, or the thinking of a university, even if your building isn't there. I'll switch, kind of go quickly over to the last part. Uh, so the African response model, where we are at right now, we're not quite finished yet. Uh, but as I said, we have core phase one, where we're just focusing on the Horn of Africa right now. Uh, phase two is supposed to add Francophone Africa, and phase three is supposed to add Lusophone Africa, uh, in an attempt to actually bring African universities together uh, to develop a coherent response uh, to, uh, to forced displacement and higher education. I'll have to, oops, have to, oh, some of the slides, oh, there we go. So we started out by thinking we will develop a new diploma uh, framed within the 21st century skills, competencies, and SEL competencies. Well, we ditched that. 
uh, in January. <laughs> thought, mm -mm. lots of experience in credit transfer and, and, and uh, credential verification have led us down a different path now. And I think it's a better path. Uh, but I'm, I'm really here to hear from you uh, and have this model be taken apart. And we'll ditch it maybe and come up with a better one. But what we've done so far is we've asked each university member of the initial network now uh, to identify one diploma. And the reason we didn't go for BA uh, degrees is fairly obvious. It is legally a very difficult route to go. So we've gone to diploma level also because women have better access to diplomas uh, than to, to bachelor's degrees. The entry requirements are a little lower. So. And we have insisted that the diplomas feed, uh, feed into four livelihoods. Yeah? For refugees to have access to higher education is not an end in itself. It's not l'art pour l'art, as they say in French. There's got to be a livelihoods option in the end. And we've studied the livelihoods, we've looked at the needs in the refugee camps, what do they have access to? And these are the ones that we've come up with. Uh, IT, social entrepreneurship, public health, and in this public service interpreting and translation. So these are the four diplomas that we've picked from the four universities. And rather than developing new ones, they already exist. And what we're now doing is we're developing um, uh, what you call electives. We identify electives in each of these diplomas. We take them out of the original draft, and we insert uh, electives on critical thinking uh, embedded in social emotional learning uh, and other electives that we may develop based on the needs. So this is where we're at with the model and as I said I'd be absolutely delighted if you take it apart and tell me this is rubbish. Uh, uh, any criticism, uh, this is really for sharing and hoping to get feedback uh, but also uh, you know to insist once again, our donor has insisted, we were delighted. The donor says it's an African problem and needs an African solution. We couldn't agree more. Uh, and I really hope that, you know, as the University of Geneva, we are just a catalyst. Uh, but it's yours to, you know, take and develop further. And obviously, we would love to be part of the conversation in the future. Um, but it's 